Welcome everyone to our fourth and final culture talk of the week. Um, today we're going to be talking about the after work nomikai and learning more about the work culture in Japan. Um, we've been hosting these sessions throughout the week to celebrate International Education Week. Um, as a very international company ourselves, we really want to learn more about the working cultures in some of the locations where we have internship programs. Um, we're welcoming today two amazing speakers, Alex and Martin. I'll ask them to introduce themselves shortly. Um, but first of all, I'm going to give you a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about. So my name's Anna. I'm going to be the webinar host today and I'm part of the Absolute Internship team. I've been hosting the sessions throughout the week, so I've learned a lot about, we had sessions on Singapore, Sweden and Spain so far. I've learned a lot and I'm very, very excited about today's Japan session. Um, I've never been and I would love to go one day, so I can't wait to hear what our amazing speakers have to say about it. And a little bit about Absolute Internship for anyone in the audience who maybe doesn't know who we, who we are. Um, we have in-person and remote international internships across Europe and Asia in 11 different cities. Um, since we were founded in 2009, we've hosted more than 5,000 interns from more than 53 nationalities in more than 800 companies worldwide and in more than 30 different industries. So, as I said, a very international and diverse company and also obviously in the education sector. So we thought it would be rude not to celebrate International Education Week. And I just thought it would be quite nice to give you a quick overview of what some of our students say about their time in Japan. So we have a program in Tokyo which is actually one of our most popular program locations um, for obvious reasons. Um, here's a nice quote from one of our students who did the program back in 2019, who said the quality of life in Tokyo is probably the highest in the world. So we'll see what we think about that shortly, but an amazing quote and just shows that, you know, the students who go there have an amazing time. The working environment was actually rated at 6.4 on average. So I'm you know, a bit intrigued by that. I want to see uh, maybe why that could be, seeing as most of our students come from the US as well as other locations around the world. So maybe it was a bit of a shock going there for them or something. Um, the living situation was rated at 8.1. So people loved living there. And the top industries that we have available in Tokyo are business development, marketing, IT, nonprofits, so quite a broad range of sectors there. And just a little bit about some of our host companies. They do tend to be very international companies, and this is probably because of the language barrier. Um, if you went to work in a purely Japanese company, you would really have to speak um, Japanese. So we tend to work with more international companies. And the supervisors we work with who um, directly manage our interns have usually either lived abroad or are from abroad, like in the US, in the UK. Um, so actually a good statistic that I was given is that 60% of the supervisors we work with in Tokyo are actually expats in Japan, like Martin himself, actually. So moving on to our speakers, we have Alex, who's one of our absolute alumni. He did the Tokyo Remote Legal Internship Program in 2020. So he's not actually been to Tokyo, but he's experienced the working culture through working in a Japanese company. And we have Martin, who's the CEO at Communion, which is one of our host companies located in Tokyo. So, Martin, would you mind starting off with a quick introduction about yourself um, and just so this, uh, the audience can get to know you a little bit? I moved to, to Tokyo in 2000 and uh, I started out working as a journalist. After a while, um, I guess I was in Tokyo for two years and I moved to Shanghai for a year working on a luxury retail project. As a journalist, I've been specializing in the fashion and uh, lifestyle sector. So I was headhunted by an entrepreneur, Japanese gentleman who was starting a, a boutique in Shanghai and he hired me to do that. So I spent about a year in Shanghai, then returned to Tokyo, where I got a job working for the Japan Times, which is the you know, number one English language newspaper in Japan. So after a couple of years there, I was again headhunted by a PR agency and uh, went to work for them. Um, I was working on various accounts, including um, Vivian Westwood, Swarovski, and Mark Jacobs. And at the time, the, um, the contract that Mark Jacobs had with their local uh, licensee partner was coming to an end. And the Louis Vuitton Group, which is the parent company of Mark Jacobs, signed a deal with uh, a very big Japanese conglomerate to create a, a, you know, a, a Japanese subsidiary. And they invited, or they headhunted me again from the agency to work in-house as their director of marketing and communications. I did that for about five years and then I founded Communion. Um, 
And we went on to work for various clients in the luxury sector, Cartier, Ferrari. Um, I picked up Vivian Westwood again, um, various other, you know, fashion, jewelry, watch companies, um, Netta Porter, Snapchat, all sorts of things that, you know, were kind of branching out from, from my fashion, my core kind of fashion uh, expertise. Um, and yeah, so I mean, it's been seven years um, that I've been running Communion and um, we've had some, you know, uh, very good experiences with interns and um, some less productive ones. Uh, you know, it's a mixed bag, but always great to have the, you know, youthful energy of, of an intern, you know, injecting a fresh perspective into the company. So, um, yeah, that's that's a very kind of quick summary of, of my career, I suppose. Amazing. That's super interesting. And you'll be able to tell us, you know, what, you know, things can make a successful intern and maybe a not so successful intern. So I'll definitely ask you about that a bit later on. And Alex, if you could quickly introduce yourself as well. Uh, yeah, sure. So um, I am an international and European law student at the Hague University of Applied Sciences. Um, I wanted to do an internship in Tokyo, but because of COVID, that wasn't really uh, an option for me. Um, and so I decided to do a remote internship. And uh, I was pleasantly surprised by the experience, actually. Uh, and when I started, I was actually working according to Japanese hours. So I would wake up at like 3.30 in the morning, my time, uh, and I would you know work for like eight hours. Um, but I only did that for a month. Uh, and when my internship actually ended, I was offered an extension. And so one month became two months and then two months became three months. And now I actually work part-time uh, at the company where I, uh, where I did my internship. Um, so I don't really have a, a very lengthy uh, or impressive uh, career path, but um, I've mainly worked within uh, the business development departments and I pretty much help out with all the legal issues. Um, and since I do have a background in, in European law, um, I'm also able to assist in the uh, well, the European market, so the European side. Uh, and I guess it just so happened that my uh, well, my interests and my abilities happen to kind of uh, you know fit fit in well with the uh, with the you know with 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 Kenja, the company that I uh, that I work at right now. So yeah, that is kind of uh, my experience. Amazing. I would say that is impressive as well, Alex. Don't put yourself down. <laughs> So I thought today we could start off with a quick, very quick poll, um, just to, you know, see some of maybe the stereotypes um, that people may have about J Japan and their working culture. So I'm going to share the poll with you now, and then I'll share you the results when everyone's voted. 70% of people think that it's true that it's common in Japan to work until 10 and 30% of people don't think it is. I was hoping, Martin, maybe you could give me an insight. Is that true that common? it's common that people work until 10 p.m.? Maybe not common, but it happens, I'm sure. Yes. It is common. Yes. Okay. <laughs> that was very straightforward. I've, I've slept on the floor of the office on numerous occasions. Um, people wow. do sleep under their desks. Mm -hmm. Many people will... Uh, work until the last train home, which tends to be 11.30 um, mm -hmm. in some cases. Um, so, I mean, especially in the big cities, Tokyo, Osaka, Nagoya, it is not uncommon to work until 10, get home at 11. Your kids are already asleep, you know, yeah. and, and um, oh. you look at the statistics, Japanese sleep less than any other nation in the world. Long hours and hard workers, by the sounds of it. Um, really but interesting. Let's just clarify that by saying it is less common these days than okay. it used to be in the past. So, okay. you know, I've been working in Japan for 20 years, 21, and um, it, it used to be more common. There's been a crackdown on it um, because, of course, it ruins one's work life balance. Mm -hmm. People are very unproductive after a certain hour and they're just sitting there killing time and um, trying to kind of project an image of, of, you know, working hard when they're not actually achieving anything and so on and so forth. So, um, yes, it, it, they're trying to stamp it. They, I mean, the authorities are trying to stamp it out and it is, um, you know, increasingly frowned upon. But if you drive around Tokyo uh, at night you can see many, many lights on in the offices in big um, tower buildings. And um, 
That's it is true. only the largest corporations that have, a, you know, they enforce a policy of no one's allowed to work after eight and they just turn off the lights, you know. And kick you out. Even in that case, you know, there are exceptions and people are there with little, you know, LED lamps still <laughs> away at their computers. Um, wow. Um, yes. Thank you for that insight because, I mean, I probably would have voted false if I could have voted. So <laughs> really interesting. And next question. The hierarchy in Japan is based more on age than on company role. True or false? What do we think? So this could maybe be, you know, who gets to have the best seat at the table? Is it based on how old you are or if you're the CEO versus, you know, the cleaner or something? Amazing. This one's a bit more close. So share the results. 60% of people in the room think it's true and 40% think it's false. Alex, do you have an insight you could share on this? Well, I'm actually a bit conflicted on this myself, to be honest, because, uh, you know, from what I've seen um, at the company where I where I uh, work at, um, people, I mean, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that if you're older that you have a higher position or if, uh, you know, if you're, if you're younger, then that you have a very good chance or, or not a good chance of being in a high position. Uh, in, in Japan, it's common to, or it's normal to respect your elders. Um, so I'm, I'm a bit conflicted on this one, to be honest, but I, I do think that, well, yeah, I mean, it's it's a bit tough, I think. What did you vote for, Alex? Trump. I voted yes. <laughs> okay. And Martin, how about you? How did you vote? Yes. Yeah, I thought so. I think that's that's maybe one of the not stereotypes, but the, the common conceptions of Japan, which is actually actually very true. So, really interesting. Okay, we have one more question, um, which is just a bit of a. So um, just in- before you go on, Anna, could I yeah. speak to that point? Yeah, please do. Please share anything because it's on my list of of um, go for it. You know, distinctive features of Japanese work culture. So. I would like to sort of frame this issue, first of all, as not being a specifically Japanese Mm -hmm. characteristic, but rather being an Asian one. Yeah. So um, Asian culture does place more respect on, uh, sorry, you know, they give more respect to their elders than we Europeans do. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's true in China, in Korea, and you know I do have experience. I, there is actually a subsidiary of, of communion in Korea, although it's not really very active. Um, and I do have experience of working with Koreans and Korean companies. Um, so it is even more pronounced in Korea. Um, I think it's slightly less pronounced in China. So you know, most ageist Korea, second ageist Japan, and then China. They're all very much seniority focused. Mm-hmm. So that's what one qualifying factor. It's not just a Japanese thing, it's an Asian thing. Second thing is hierarchy is less important in Japan than it is in the West. That is to say, it is a collectivist culture. Consensus building is very, very important matter what the leader thinks if the rest of the group his subordinates are not in alignment with the decisions he makes he or she sorry it is much much more difficult to make something happen than it is in the west which is a much more sort of pyramid like top down structure if you see what i mean yes so it's very important to get the the kind of buy-in of one's subordinates before implementing a plan Okay. Therefore, yes, seniority is very, very important, but in a way, um, the consensus is more important than the hierarchy. Okay, I see. And I actually read a lot about the fact that the group is more important than the individual. So in the US, maybe, or in the UK, it's about your individual career and making your way to the top. But maybe you could tell me if in Japan it's true that it's more of a team effort and it's about the team succeeding rather than the individual who's leading the team. Absolutely, yes. So you can see this manifested in various ways in Japan. Number one, if you look at the Forbes list of billionaires, there are only two or three Japanese on it, Mm -hmm. right? So the the Gini coefficient, which essentially expresses the wealth disparity gap in in, um, income, is very, very low in Japan. So the gap between the, the average working class person and the top of the top it's very, very small, mm-hmm. especially when you compare it to America, where there are hundreds of billionaires. You know, you've got B 
billionaires, but there aren't any billionaires in Japan, really. They have more millionaires than anyone else, but there aren't any billionaires, right? So it's if you were to kind of express it as a bell curve, it would be a very flat bell curve. Yeah. Um, and um, that is, um, or hold it, no, it, it, sorry, it would be the opposite. <laughs> it, it, you know, there's a very big middle and nothing at the extremes, whereas America is more flat. So you have extreme poverty, extreme wealth. Those extremes are not permitted in Japanese society. So essentially billionaires just get kind of cut off, you know, yeah. um, or squashed. Anyway, so the, the other point I was going to make about seniority is, and, and uh, you know, you asked me for an anecdote, right? So um, it's not strictly work-related, but I was out with, with a colleague. You know, we were having ramen um, to celebrate the completion of a job. And into the, the restaurant come a couple of guys who weren't very well put together, if you see what I mean, but... Um, one of them recognized the, the gentleman who was sitting next to me and immediately you know, started talking to him in a not very respectful tone. So even though the guy that I'm with is far more successful, they went to school together and this guy is one year older than him. Okay. So because he was hit, so I mean, I don't know if you guys follow manga or, you know, anime or whatever, but there's this Kohai Senpai thing, right? So if the guy's one year older than you at school, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, the CEO of some company and you're super successful and you've got, you know, a Rolls Royce and blah, blah, blah. He's yeah. always going to be your senior. Show right? him because respect. He's one year older <laughs> than you, right? So yeah. this is, and in Korea, it's crazy. Like the first thing people will ask you, how old are you? The mm. first thing they want to know, how old are you? It's very important to them to know your age. It's, okay. it's less important oh. in Japan. Koreans are obsessed with it. And so when they tell you their age, they count from like conception. Yeah, because they all want to add an extra year. So, you know, oh, yeah. you're one when you're, when you're a fetus, right? <laughs> so yeah, um, yeah. I could be 45. I just turned 44, but I'd be 45 because, you know, I, I, they count an extra you year. Be, you want to be one year older than you are. <laughs> right. So yeah. I mean, this is it's very, very important. And, um, yes, I mean, this kind of links to the fact that, high, you know, the hierarchy isn't as important as the consensus. Yeah. This age thing really is very, very important. And it's, it's very rare to find a, a boss who's younger than his subordinates. Now, when I was at Mark Jacobs Japan, we did have a young CEO. He was a genius and, you know, had kind of promoted, you know, got promotion because he was a very special individual, very bilingual, you know, grown up in Texas partly and was in, in, you know, incredibly smart. But even he, or, you know, had to kiss ass mm -hmm. to the, excuse my French, to the more senior members of the team. Yeah. Um, and he was always, you know, very deferential to them, always seeking their, their approval for his decision processes, always, you know, being very respectful to them in front of the other members of the team. And that's just a, a in, you know, indelible part of the Japanese mindset. Yeah. That, so that's a really uh, important, you know. Be respected. And I would imagine that this is probably one of the reasons that the Japan work environment gets a low rating, because it's just impossible that a young person could have more wisdom or experience than older people in the minds of the Japanese, right? So an intern is young, therefore, don't have as much to offer. Opinion doesn't matter so much. You're expected to just sit and watch and learn. Yeah. So I don't okay. know if you're familiar with the, the Suzuki method of, of violin playing, but essentially for the first year, you just sit and watch. You don't actually touch a violin, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the same with the with the Japanese apprenticeship system, whereby you know the apprentice spends the first year of their apprenticeship just observing. They don't touch the tools, they don't do any work, they just clean the tools, yeah. you know, oh. carry stuff around, make the coffee fetch the lunch, do that kind of stuff. Oh, so from an old school Japanese point of view, the intern is there to, to, to mm -hmm. just fetch the coffee, make copies, you know, do stuff. But that's just considered to be an, a normal part of the learning process. And just by kind of passively absorbing uh, 
what you see and hear, you learn. Yeah. And it's actually easier to absorb and, and you know, the, the kind of culture and the mindset if you don't have any tasks. If mm-hmm. your only task is just to observe and, and learn, you can take on a lot more than if you're kind of busy with stuff and you're focused on one thing. You can kind of get, get more of a, an overall view, yeah. if you like, if, if you are in that position. So I do think that's a... Um, it does have its advantages. I can imagine that for an, you know, gung-ho young intern, yeah. it would be extremely frustrating. I'd love um, to ask Alex what, what your experience was as, and as an intern in Japan. Yeah, sure, Being sure. If you've done it, we can ask, ask you. <laughs> yeah, um, well, I actually, they actually, I they interested a lot of things to me when I, when I started. Um, and so I was able to like kind of quickly learn uh, a lot of new skills and apply them as well. Um, so while it was tricky for me in the beginning, uh, eventually I, I, I felt like I had really grown uh, when it comes to what I'm, you know, what I was able to to, to offer, what I was able, what I was able to do. Um, so I thought, that, I thought that was very interesting. Um, I don't, I don't necessarily think that's that's the Japanese approach of, of doing it, um, but nevertheless, I, I really kind of enjoyed it. Um, so yeah, that's. That's kind of my experience regarding that. I think maybe because, you know, Kenja is a, such a small company and we tend to work with the smaller companies in, in Tokyo. Uh, maybe that's a way that, you know, you can try and get a bit more responsibility. But as Martin said, even observing is a great experience. Um, and did you have any culture shocks? I know that you didn't actually go to Tokyo, but in mm-hmm. terms of like, you know, the working culture and working with your colleagues and all of those things. Um, well, there haven't really been any, any problems for me personally. I definitely noticed that there is a, a, a culture, kind of a, a kind of a cultural difference. Um, because well, we're like the working culture in, in Europe, uh, is, is very different from, uh, the working culture in Asia. Um, but since I, I, I do study international law and I study with, uh, you know, with, with other students from all over the world, um, I've already been kind of, kind of exposed to, uh, Lots of different people who all have different experiences, different opinions, different ways of of, of communicating. Even um, and what I think is is if you don't have this kind of experience, if you've never kind of worked in an international environments, um, that it really helps to have uh, some. I think it's called cultural intelligence. It's it's kind of a buzzword, but it's um, it's 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 not like IQ. It's more like emotional intelligence. Mm-hmm. Um, so if, if you read a lot about Jap- about Japan, about Japanese culture, if you try to kind of immerse yourself in it, uh, learn a lot about it, then you're going to have a, a very, well, you're going to have an easier time uh, adjusting to it. And you don't really get to experience a culture shock. Or if you do, then it's not going to be as as bad as if, if you kind of uh, jump right in and don't know what to expect. So that would be, that would be my advice. <laughs> Great advice. And Martin, I know we touched on the fact that people do tend to work quite late, but is after work a big thing in Tokyo, like social life with your co-workers? I know this talk is actually called the after work nomikai. So I'd love to hear about that nomikai and what that word actually means. Nomikai, yeah. Um, so there's actually a, a portmanteau word in Japanese, nomunication. So that's <laughs> nomu to drink and communication, nomunication. So, it's, it's rather like the ancient um, medieval European way, which is where um, the leaders of the society would get drunk and then the truth comes out while they're wasted mm-hmm. and then they would meet again the following day and discuss what had emerged <laughs> while they were drunk. And when people told their true opinions without kind of being held back and, and then make decisions on the basis of that okay. as a, a kind of reflection on, on the, the drunk talk. That is very similar in Japan because people are, are extremely reserved. They're very risk averse. They don't like expressing their true opinions. Um, but when they get drunk... <laughs> that all goes out the window. <laughs> it just pops out, right? So, um, yes, that is a very important part of the Japanese corporate culture. I've never been fond of it because I'm not a strong drinker. I don't like alcohol very much. And so I, since I founded Communion, you know, I, re- I try to limit that to, 
to the greatest extent possible and just encourage people to communicate normally. <laughs> communicate That's normally. very interesting. For a communication <laughs> company, you know, so let's just communicate. Um, but um, we all, you know, we do have a company drink um, session um, for people's birthdays. Um, not everybody, but most people's birthdays and um, New Year's, like oh, nice. end of year kind nice of thing. Questions. We actually do have a question for you, Martin, okay. in the in the chat. So, Martin, you mentioned you were headhunted several times in your career. Was this by chance or a result of networking you did? Do you have any tips for young professionals? Um, great question. Uh, so the first time I was headhunted... Well, I guess, I mean, I was headhunted as, as a writer by um, several magazines. You know, while I was freelancing, I was working as an editor, but also working as a freelance writer. And I guess just the, it's the internet. You know, people saw my articles and were like, oh, we want one of those. You know, can you can you do an interview with Shu Uemura or can you do this or that? Um, so it was just kind of having a web presence. And so and that's how I got the Japan Times job, just because there's kind of the strength of my work spoke for itself, um, I got commissioned, I produced good work, and I was a stringer for them. And then, they, you know, when I came back to Japan from Shanghai, I, I you know, I called my editor and was like, I need a job. Um, and he was like, yeah, sure, you know, kind of thing. Um, and then I, so it was just the, my articles in the Japan Times then attracted the attention of the CEO of this PR agency who picked me up. So, I mean, that is obviously, um, pretty much unique to the journalism industry where, you know, your work is out there under your byline. Um, it would, I mean, perhaps in the law industry, if, you know, your name is in, in academia as well, you know, publish a paper, your name is on it. Someone notices that and they're like, oh, we want this guy in our department. You know, he's working with Professor such and such. Or So in that sense, it's easy. Um, for those types of industries, I think in a lot of other industries that isn't the case. You know, as a PR guy, networking is everything, yeah. right? So I, I relentlessly networked for for a very long time. You know, in Japanese, there's this business card culture. Everyone has a business card, so you know, Just giving I them to everyone. Like, oh, <laughs> I got 10 new Meishi today, you know, look at this Meishi, I've got a Meishi from Nikkei, you know, I've got a Meishi from Mitsubishi, you know, <laughs> and I, you know, I'm older and they were like, by industry, alphabetical, oh, okay. and, and then you religiously send those people emails, letters, end of year's greetings, presents, um, you know, whatever, um, and that's very, very important, so... Amazing. Yes, networking is really important. Yes, networking is the way to get noticed. Um, you know, that I'm sure it's just doing the obvious, right? So you join industry bodies, you can go on to groups and forums on LinkedIn, which is a very you know, mm -hmm. useful platform. Everyone should be on in on LinkedIn, get the premium, you know, <laughs> sign up, make yourself look no, seriously, it's a great investment, you know. Yeah. Do that. It's, it's the standout, standout thing. Make mm -hmm. sure you have a nice, clean presence on Facebook. Make sure you've got a nice Instagram. Get some fake followers on Instagram. You know, <laughs> it's, it's literally 50 bucks to get 1,000 followers. Just do it. You know, make yourself look good. And people are, and, and that's that's what people check. Yeah. People don't look through your followers on Instagram. Okay. They just look at the number. How many people, how popular is this dude, you know? Mm -hmm. So... Do that, make yourself look good on the internet because that's how people will check you out. Um, and, uh, you know, I think in the era of, of COVID, it's increasingly difficult to go to real life networking events, right? So, um, and obviously for people who are not in big cities, that is also very difficult. So having a strong web presence is very, very important. And, you know, if you can, I know like the Huffington Post or some other publication, publications like that um, take contributions from people without paying them, you know, but people just do it to build a profile. I have friends who've, who've done that, you know, slaving away for months on one article. And once it's up there on whatever, you know, publication it is, boom, you know, you, you, you're, you're some 
somebody. So, you know, whether you're in engineering, biotech, law, or, you know, communications, whatever it is, you know, if you can just make yourself look good on the net, that's how you're going to get picked up. Um, yes, it. building friendships and having people like hook you up. I mean, especially with my school buddies in the UK, I know multiple instances of, you know, friends who work for a bank and then they give their old school chum or their, you know, school chum's brother or somebody a job and, you know, leg up kind of thing. I'm sure in Southern Europe, I know a lot of your, um, you, you know, your ba the, the original offices in Spain. So, you know, Spain, Italy, Greece, that's all about the, the kind of the family connection, you know. That's much less the case in Northern Europe and the States. It's less, you know, we're, we're, we're more kind of trusting people. And the same, this, that is to say, you know, we're less nepotistic. And um, that's also the case in Japan. It's very frowned upon to give a family member a job or do, do anything like that. So, um, I see. Yeah, that's it's, it's just about kind of building a reputation. And I think online reputation is the most important thing in, in, the, in the 2020s. In these days. Yeah. And, and Alex, just a really quick one. Could you tell us about your like best advice or best practices for being an intern in Japan? Yeah, well, uh, not necessarily just for Japan, but do your absolute best. Um, I know this seems very straightforward, but uh, I've, what I've seen from from other uh, from other interns um, is that I mean, there there have been some instances where uh, it was it was really hard because I also I also worked with other interns uh, on some group projects, um, and some people just didn't show up for for meetings or they didn't show up for uh, or didn't do, do do their tasks, and you would think that this is something that is is you know obvious, but um, some people they, they just don't really put in all of their efforts. And it leads to a lot of problems, a lot of miscommunication. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's just, just do your best. It's, <laughs> that's my number one advice. Just make yeah. sure you show up, make sure you, um, you know, maybe um, if there's something you can't do, then make sure to, um, I'm trying to think of the word, uh, escalates tasks. So, so meaning if there's something you can't do yourself, maybe uh, let your supervisor know, uh, ask for help. Um, instead of kind of just passively waiting and, and yeah. seeing what's going to happen. And perhaps also one more thing um, is, is I kind of, I kind of learned this the hard way. Um, when you have assignments at school, it's very different from when you're actually working uh, at a company because uh, you have deadlines. And if, if you don't meet those and you need to meet those deadlines, no matter what, but when you're working for a company, it's not the, not the deadlines that matter as much as the quality of the work. Um, and so if, if you kind of try to do things quickly, uh, and if you try to meet, you know, meet your deadlines, uh, sometimes you end up not, you know, creating the, the, the best work, yeah, I suppose. Rushing. And yeah, and that, that just, that's, that's a lot worse. It's, it's better to take a bit more time to ask for, for an extension, uh, and just do your absolute best. So that's my advice. Advice. We have another question here for Mark. Hold on. Can I, can I give my advice? Yes. Sure. Go for it. <laughs> just, just to kind of, um, compliment what, my, my problem with my interns so far, you know, so we're a communications agency. It's a media relations, it's called public relations, but it's really media relations. So we're dealing with the, we, we're the middleman between the brand and the media. So magazines, TV, radio, internet, media, yeah. whatever. Um, and so language is very, very important. So I, I just hired an intern earlier this year, Gaelish, it's a lady from France, she speaks really good Japanese. So she's the only one who spoke really good Japanese. And boom, she got a job. She's doing a great job. She's working on G-Star, the denim brand now. Doing a great job, super happy, you know, getting paid. You know, her dream has come true. And it's the language thing. So almost all the other interns I've had, and I've had Dutch people, Portuguese people, uh, you know, Americans, uh, Chinese various different people, they were mostly doing creative work. So mostly graphic design. Yeah. So I give very detailed instructions, very clear instructions, and almost like Germans too. Every time they're like, oh yeah, you know, you told me to do it like this, but I thought maybe this way would be better. I'm like, I knew what I wanted. I told you what I wanted you to do. Yeah, I don't, I don't have to give you a reason why I'm telling you to do it like that. 
I know why I asked you to do that. It's not your position to question that. Just do what I told you to do. You know, yeah. so, and it means that they just have to redo it because that, that's, I didn't want it that mm-hmm. way. And there's a reason that I didn't want it that way. I knew exactly what I wanted. I told them exactly what to do. They don't do it. So they miss the deadline. The quality of the work is bad. It pisses me off, you know. So my advice to the intern was li- to, to all interns would be, listen to what your boss tells you to do. Do that and don't do anything else. You know, don't yeah. try and embellish or embroider the task. Don't bring your own ideas. Yeah, that's not what you're being asked to do. Do what you've been asked to do. When you've done that, then you can say, by the way, Martin, I thought that maybe, you know, if we put like a gray border around here, it might look better. And I'd say, no, 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 we can't have a border because look, I sent them a document last week and it didn't have a gray border and I want to keep the, the image consistent. So it can't have a gray border on it. Sorry, you know, or, you know, There's I also want to put lines yeah. on the thing here. Like, oh well, yeah, I didn't like those lines. It doesn't get matter what you like. You know? <laughs> There's a reason. So that, that's my advice. So I don't know to the extent that that would apply to other fields, um, yeah. but, you know, Listen to the to, to what you're being instructed to do. Don't try and like impose your own ideas on it because it's boring or because you know you don't think it's cool or whatever. Just do what you've been told to do, do it. And then if you've got a cool idea and you think, you know, run it by the person after you've completed it according to the instructions yeah. you've been given. That's really interesting because we actually had the session about Spain yesterday and almost the opposite advice was given. It was, you know, like go above and beyond, do your own thing, present your own ideas. So like, it's really interesting to have these two sessions back to back because we can see the differing opinions in, in different cultures. So that's really, really interesting insight. Going to the question just while we still have some time. Um, Nathan's asking, he's a 43-year-old student looking for an internship in Japan and to work there after he completes the degree. Would that be an issue with the age factors mentioned, potentially being older than the CEO or other people I work with, yet being new? What do you think about that? Yes, I think that would be an issue. It depends, once again, on the language ability, what field he's in. Mm -hmm. Um, So basically, you know, learn a bit of the language and you might have a chance. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I mean, the more of the language you can speak, the more of a chance you've got. So, you know, watch some Japanese TV movies, watch the same Japanese movie 10 times. Mm -hmm. So you know what they're going to say before they say it. If you can get hold of some Japanese office dramas, and there are hundreds of these, they're awful. You have to just (laughs) watch an office drama, watch people talking in an office environment, and then you you will know what they're going to say before they say it. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that's very important. You know, and I, you can give him my email address. I'll give him some advice. Yeah, of course. Um, he's marketing and he's a beginner at Japanese. Yeah. So for specific questions, I'll I'll put in the chat. I'll put your email address if that's okay with you, Martin. And then so if anyone just one, one other thing that's on my list of notes here is you know. So I, I was going to say you know, collectivist mindset, seniority, cautious. So very they're very slow, risk averse. That can be very frustrating. Process over results. Yeah, so European people are very results focused, but Japanese people are process focused. So you must respect the process. That means never be late. You know, just as Alex mentioned, punctuality is very important. You know, you don't have the right to turn up late. You don't have the right to, to miss a deadline. You know, are you special? Yeah, you're better than everybody else. They hate that. Yeah, so you've got to, even if you get shit results, excuse my French again. You must respect the process. The process is more important. If you followed the rules, you did what was written in the manual, the results weren't weren't good, that doesn't matter. The, the fact that you respected the process and you followed the process is far more important. Next thing, the final thing is lack of respect for ideas and intellectual property. This goes for China, Japan, and Korea. So the stereotype is Japanese people take the ideas from Europe and Kaizen, they improve them, right? So the car, invented in Europe, but Japanese cars are better than European cars because they just improved them. They, you know, re-engineered what about them. trains? <laughs> right, trains, anything, right? Electronics, they do it better, but they don't have the originality, right? Mm-hmm. So it's very frustrating for me because I am partly an ideas guy. I would love to get paid for my ideas, but Japanese people don't pay for ideas. Ideas are free. 
ideas don't have any value. Same in China, same in Korea. You can't get paid for your ideas very much. And, and, and so it, you have to have like the services or implementation or execution, right? So you come up with the idea for a great graphic design, but you have to make the graphic design. Mm -hmm. You come up with a great idea for like a video, but you've got to be the guy who makes the video as well as co coming up with the ideas. Now, having said that, this presents a great opportunity for foreigners because Japanese people are, are very aware of the fact that they lack originality, that they lack this, you know, the, the kind of creative spark that Europeans have, right? Sorry to frame everything in race the whole time. It's very important. So um, if you can kind of find a niche in a company where you're the ideas guy, that's where a foreigner who doesn't speak great Japanese yeah. Get your foot in the door there. <laughs> oh yeah, Nathan's the dude who always comes up with these crazy yeah. ideas, and like, so we take his ideas, we put our Japanese spin on them, and boom, you know, it's yeah. a great campaign, it's a great, um, you know, product mm -hmm. idea or whatever. But business development, <laughs> Nathan's ideas are the craziest. He says, "Sweet, <laughs> if you can, um, you can sell yourself like that, Nathan." There are many Japanese companies that are aware that it's the foreign, they have foreigners to come up with the ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the, the best thing is if you can find a way to, you know, either storyboard it, design it, turn, animate it, film it, paint it. I don't know what, you know, to, 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 to take out that, um, actualization, realization, mm -hmm. you know, turning the idea into a, into reality, so we were over time now, but um, that's that's where you can that's where you can build a niche for yourself in the marketing. Amazing. Um, I see. There's a question about um, internships in general. I'm going to put my email in the chat as well. If anyone's interested in doing an internship in Tokyo, we do still have availability for next summer. Um, so drop me an email, and I can give you more information. There'll also be more information in the follow up that will be going out tomorrow. Um, yeah, we actually wow, that went so quickly. <laughs> that went super oh, quick. We've had amazing insights from our speakers. I'm super grateful to both of you. Um, so yeah, thank you again, everyone for joining us um, for this. Uh, some of you might have come to every single session. So thank you a lot for coming. It's been an amazing International Education Week. Thank you to our speakers. Um, you can follow those QR codes there um, to check out our social media. Um, I'm seeing some amazing thank yous uh, in, the, in the chat. So yeah, thank you again, speakers. And I hope you all have a great rest of your day and rest of your week. Um, yeah, we're all done. Thank you again. Thank you too. Good luck, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.